side here, there's a, a plate and you have a battery and this is a positive side and down at the bottom there's a plate and that's the negative side. Okay, um, and you have a circle in a medium here that would enable current to flow from here to here. Um, all right, what happens is these, these, what you recognize as streamlines around the circle can be uh, viewed as potential lines. And the reason they're electrical potential lines is, is because they're lining up with, the, with this plate up here that's at some value, and, and one line is actually a straight line. And it gets closer to this way, it takes on the curvature of this. And um, the same way on the opposite side of the axis. Now, you also know that current is flowing from the top here to the bottom. And so those current lines will be perpendicular everywhere on their trip to the other side. And that demonstrates the per perpendicularity of, uh, of flow that represents electromagnetic characteristic. Now, what happened at um, Voyager 2 when it passed the rings of Saturn? Uh, it's interesting in that we had aboard a plasma probe ring detector. So that we're, we're examining, pro, uh, examining uh, plasma in the uh, ring. And uh, so that, um, you know, heretofore nobody has um, acknowledged that the rings can contain plasma. Well, here's a little graph that um, I'll show what the ring thickness is for this particular thing. Now, mind you, the ring thickness is thought of as being only about 10 miles thick. That is what is being toted right now. It's 10 miles or less. And uh, yes, the rings can get that thin, but they can also be quite thick, depending upon how close to a, a, one of these uh, EMVs uh, that the measurement is taken by, because they, they are thick. And so the stuff that came out will be thick in that locality. All right, now going on here, this curve is the path of Voyager 2 past the ring. Now, in a very short interval here, um, the instrument is, is working away and it's creating a, a time history of what it sees in the way of plasma. Now, uh, the instrument works with different frequencies, so it can sense plasma in different frequencies. And the way it's recorded is in decibels. So when you get some blimp, some blips here, why um, uh, that's, that's the measurement. So nothing will happen for a while, and then all of a sudden you get a blip across here, and that trace will continue. The same way all along here, you see it's time between here and here, and um, there are these little spreads all along here. Um, now you can calculate the uh, thickness of the ring by distance equals velocity times time. And you do know the velocity of the uh, spacecraft, and you know uh, the time because it's recorded. And so what you do is to take the little difference in time represented by a spread of one of these little uh, normal distribution kinds of curves in there, and that will give you the, uh, the ring thickness. Now, you notice that on the left side, uh, the, uh, the, the length of those rises are is greater than on the top side. Here it looks like very little. So this means that you're gonna get a spread in the, um, in the, uh, the numbers that you assert are the thickness of, uh, of, of the ring, and indeed you do. Uh, I got 435 to over 600 uh, miles for that. Okay, that is a large distance, uh, and this is the only 
sample that I know of that uh, says that you can have really thick rings, and the reason is that there's an object in there, and this, this time they measured one fairly close to the object and got a, a fairly large number for thickness. Now, if it had been measured at another point, say, well aft of a body that was in there, um, they wouldn't have seen a thick ring at all. It, it would have been uh, like a contrail from an airplane, it would have faded off, and um, they would have done a uh, much less value for the uh, ring thickness. So when you talk to people about ring thickness, you can say, well, it can vary all over the place. Now, here is a, an interesting picture, at least to me. Uh, before I uh, published Ring Makers of Saturn, I, I went through uh, astronomy literature to see if I couldn't find something that um, uh, was similar to what I had, if that was all possible. And this is the one that seemed most appropriate. Uh, here is a picture of Saturn. and. Um, it's labeled Passage of a Star. Um, there were two astronomers, Knight and Ainsley, in Great Britain, and they were both astronomers but working at different laboratories. And Knight spotted a, what he called a, a star, uh, in as much as it was very intensely lit, uh, passing through the ring of Saturn. And you see that the path it's on is also the same path where we found the clipped ring for um, uh, Saturn in what I've showed you before. So this is why it struck me as being a very applicable uh, kind of thing. And uh, Knight followed that along and into the uh, Cassini division. And that's about where Ainsley picked it up because it was such a clear, spot to be in, he could see it, he could see it. And um, both, both gents, when they got together afterwards, uh, composed the composite picture there that you can see that it, it was on the straight line course going through the uh, Cassini division and, and out. Now, Knight said that, uh, gee, this thing really ate its way right through the ring with no problem. And he was really amazed. And as a matter of fact, this is uh, one of the uh, famous, you might say, uh, accomplishments of the time. Uh, it was felt that uh, it was proven by this that there was nothing in the A-ring. Well, that may have been true once, but it, that's no longer true, as you know, because uh, we, we see stuff in the Cassini division. Now we're going to take you out to Miranda, which is a uh, it's a uh, satellite of Uranus. Uh, you've lost me on this one. Doesn't look like it needs to be lightened up a little bit. Okay, um, this looks completely different from anything I have seen in this picture. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll go through it. Um, my original thought was that uh, this object right here was a part of a continuous object that goes through here. Actually, what it looks like, the object is here and goes way down through here. So. Uh, I have to change my mind about the way this picture looks. But nevertheless, uh, this looks like a, a short uh, EMV right through here. And there's a, a streamer that rises right up there. And then there's, uh, this would be the end. You can see it's sort of circular in character. 
and has a, a protrusion down below it. And that is characteristic of the kind of thing that I saw at Pahara Dunes. Um, and then there is um, projection material out here. And that, too, is characteristic of one of these EMVs. Now, it looks like that, in fact, there are, in the way they got them blown up here, that there is another object right in here. And uh, that it has a lateral protrusion way out here. Uh, and uh, there is a vision from it. Uh, the, the thing that I think is so significant about this picture is that these elements right down here at the bottom, they're a thin little thing labeled eight and nine. I, I call them energy rolls because uh, obviously these EMVs can um, use something and they carry along with them so that they can make any kind of form that they want. And so to, to me, these elements along here are uh, stores, such as like a fighter airplane carries torpedoes and so forth. They call that stores. And uh, now, with those in position there, you see they've controlled all the emissions that have come out of that area. Um, they've done it deliberately. Um, and underneath there, why be, they probably have something that we'd like to know about. Um, so it, it shows that they're capable of managing their, their, their image uh, look. And <clears throat> now that they're electromagnetic, that means that uh, they can do this uh, to make any shape they want, an infinite number of shapes. And so what you find is that um, in being an infinite number of shapes, you can't, you, you think you're seeing things are different from time to time. Well, in a way that is true, but it's all coming from one kind of unit. And it just has varying things that it can do. And so these varying things can look different so that you lose the significant idea that there is one basic thing that's, that's showing all these peculiar things. Now, how are ring makers as UFOs? Well, the answer to that question is they make darn good UFOs. At the top of the picture to the left, uh, now first let me say the little black bar where we're, wherever it appears is uh, just a simple representation of, a, of an EMV. Now, uh, on the top to the left, why it shows a, a hump on the top and the bottom. Uh, to the right of that, why that hump and uh, what's around there it could make it look like a hat. And um, the central picture would be a cross section of that and it would look, look that way. Uh, now, they can have uh, emissions that are not circular, 